Mike, I want to start with you about the NFL. First of all, how are things? I am great. It's good to be with you. It's been a, an incredible week in our country. And uh, here we are still playing football, too, Peter, on our side of the fence, right? I mean, sometimes I think we're judging the season with the normal tape measures that we use. This coach yeah. should be on the hot seat. This GM, college football, all that. And we forget how how atypical this season is and how we really need to have some patience normally. Uh, I'm just thankful that we're in November and we're still playing football at both the college and the pro level. I, I don't know if uh, we're sitting here in July and August talking that we would think, yeah, that's going to happen. It's amazing to me that let's just say, um, you know, as we sit here right now, one of the things I just looked at before you, you and I are recording this late Tuesday afternoon, election day, uh, and just before we came on, I saw that Joe Ellis, the president of the Denver Broncos, and John Elway, the GM, uh, and obviously the guy who runs all football operations, I've just tested positive for COVID, so they'll be home. And it just, it really says to me how amazing it is that here we are entering week nine of the NFL season. First game, Green Bay at San Francisco. Green Bay which is an incredible story in and of itself. Yeah. There is no NFL market with as big a hot spot right now as Green Bay. And they're playing football. They'll play on Thursday night in San Francisco, apparently without any uh, significant COVID drama. And I, I find it amazing that here we are entering week nine. And as of right now, the season is on schedule to be played with, with 256 games. Yeah, and Peter, I think we're seeing the parallels as more positive tests and more people seem to be dealing with COVID around the country. We're seeing it impact the NFL a bit more. And you and I, as uh, many others are, are on the calls on Sunday morning that the NFL has been doing. And when you go through those calls, you see what's really happening. The, the virus continues to give us points where we can learn. And what the NFL is doing is they are adjusting their protocols as things go on. So there are three, four, five very different things than what were happening at the start of training camp and the start of the right. season. And when we're on those calls, I hear all the detail from football operations and medical and at the team side and for the players union. And I, as, a, as somebody who's able to do my job in America, which not everyone is able to do right now, I find myself uh, less critical and extraordinarily appreciative of the scientists, the doctors, the people in all sports who are helping to ha make this season go on. Because, you know, you sit down Thursday night, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, Sunday, Monday night, there's, there's football on. That's about the most normal thing going on in our country. And it's a lot of sacrifice. And the players and coaches and their families, too. I, I shouldn't forget them. I think we're not really talking enough about the sacrifices in the individual lives of these people. Look, they're, they're getting compensated at the pro level. They love to do it. It's their job. But you talk to a lot of them. They are sacrificing what their normal life is to make sure that they are not the ones to bring down a team, even by an accidental contact with somebody who's positive. So I, I just have a real appreciation this year, maybe more than ever, for the game, the athletes, and the people around us. You know, I want to, I had not planned to ask you about this, but I'm really sure. curious. About three weeks ago, I was on the phone because after the games on Sunday, I get as many players, maybe a coach, as I can get to talk to for my column on Monday. Right. And I had about five minutes time to kill with one PR guy who was out at the buses. He was going to mm -hmm. get his quarterback to talk to me before he got on the bus to go to the airport. So we're just shooting the breeze a little bit. And he told me that he is, has told his wife, he's got, they got two children. And he said, I got to live in the guest room this year. Yeah. And the kids are at school and you are out in the community and out at the grocery store and out at school with the kids. They have both in-person learning at school. They're young kids. And he said, I, I can't risk it. Right. I can't risk it. I'm one of the 100 people around uh, around my team, mm -hmm. and I can't risk bringing it in. So he stays in his guest room, and he basically uh, sees his family. But he said for the season to his kids, he can't. He just can't hug them. Yeah, you know, and it's really it really bothers him. Even though it probably wouldn't actually do anything. I mean, how do you really know? 
how did Eric Sugarman know with the Minnesota Vikings before the year, the trainer, exactly. uh, that he was going to, he was going to, uh, you know, get the virus probably outside the facility somewhere. And I don't, I, I don't know if you've run into many or any of those stories, but they're, and again, nobody is asking anybody to cry for these guys, no, but no. a lot of them are having to change their lives because of it. Yeah, we, we talk football, right? This is what we do is we cover the sport. I think for all of us that are still able to do what we do, it's twice as difficult and maybe half as enjoyable as it once was. And that has just put me in a window of appreciation. We, we get to broadcast a Notre Dame Clemson game on Saturday, which is a top five game at Notre Dame Stadium. Well, that, that's rare, right? You don't get that. Those are the special things. That's really going to be fun, by the oh, way. Oh, guy, okay. we, we can't <laughs> wait. I, I've been waiting for this for three weeks. I've been hoping both teams could get through to this point. But, uh, you, know, you know, Peter, I, you, I talked to the quarterback at Notre Dame, Ian Book, as we do during the year, and he's done several interviews. He's had to adjust his life, his schedule. He's really not interacting with people on campus. So all types of things. I've spoken to a, a PR person in the league, not the same exact story, but a similar story. Afraid to go see family who live in the area because family has kids that go to schools. It, it's just a different time, right? And yeah. I, I, I just think we continue to judge football emotionally after games the same way. Trade him. Can this coach survive? Is this GM really going to be able to get another year out of this? And sometimes we have to just put on the brakes and say, it's really unfair to use the same measuring stick this year as we have the last two, three, four, five years. It's just different this year. Mike, I'll tell you, one of the interesting things was I wrote a column uh, back in May where I said, you know, I, I, I really thought at that time that everybody was being a little bit too confident about right. the virus, that it was going to go away and all that. And part of this came from a conversation I had from Ant with Anthony Fauci. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Fauci basically said, this is, this is going to hang around. Yeah. This absolutely unequivocally will hang around. We're going to be dealing with it in this country into 2021. And that was the first time somebody said that definitively. And I said, wow. And I, I remember I wrote my column the week after I did Fauci. And I wrote my column and said, essentially, people have to get ready for a different year. And they have to get ready for an unfair year. And right. sometimes I'll be on the phone with a general manager or maybe a coach. And, and I, I'll be honest with you. I'm really, really impressed with these coaches. Yes. And, and most of the general managers, but there's a few general managers who really get ticked off about the constant changing of the rules. There's another two and a half page right, memo right. that went out from the league again today about, yes. about protocols, about players on the field after sideline length. And, yep. All yeah, this stuff. Yeah. yeah all of it. But, all but, of it. but I, and, and I just feel like, if you want a season, you better get ready for some unfair stuff to happen. And that's really the way it's been. And, and, and that's the way it's go, going to continue to be. The schedule will, will work against teams. Games will get moved and pushed back. You know, if, if things continue to increase with the percentages nationally, it's going to impact the league. The, the, the players can't be in a complete bubble. Peter, I'm curious if there's going to be a bubble for the playoffs. Because I, I, I wonder I wonder if you get to that point of the season where you really can't push a game back a yeah. week, maybe 24 hours. I, I do wonder if looking at I how, bet there will work, be. how it worked for the postseason for baseball, basketball, and hockey, yeah. very different sports, I understand. But I, I think maybe when we get to the playoffs, not, not necessarily just in one location for the games, but maybe you bubble in your market, fly to the other city, and that, that bubble kind of trans, translates to the air travel, the hotel stay in the road city, and you play the playoff game. You know, Sean Payton, when he did this, Sean Payton and the Saints right. approached the Lowe's Hotel on the outskirts of the French Quarter in New Orleans, and they asked if they could basically have this hotel for six weeks. And so they made some financial deal, whatever they did. And I think about 135 out of 165 uh, people with the Saints, uh, the 100 essential employees, and then all the, the people who were in training camp. Might have been more than 165, I'm sure it was. But anyway, all but 30 of them chose to stay at the Lowe's. Yeah. They went there. They basically hunkered down there. They, they were told unofficially, you know, we're not going to prevent you from going to take a walk, but you can't break 
the bubble. You can't go drinking in the quarter. Right. But anyway, so and Peyton told me that he's had a lot of people, a lot of coaches in the league talk to him about that and how they did it. And a lot of teams want to do that, Mike. And I believe that the NFL is going to do that in the postseason. I think that they are sure that, as you said, you can't push games back in January. Right. You got, you just got to play them. So I would bet exactly that they would do a bubble in January. Uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how far we get along the path here. Will we play the full 16? Uh, because you take a, take a step back, and this is usually, Peter, right? The time that I know you, you, with your 32, you rank them every week. But you start looking and go, okay, who's for real? I found myself watching the fourth quarter of the Monday night game, that feeling the Bucks were going to take the lead and we hold off the Giants, even though it got close at the end with the two-point conversion and the slight controversy over P.I. or no P.I. I, I'm just sitting there going, okay. This team's for real. This is one of the teams that's in the group, in the conversation. And I'm having a hard time filling up that little you know, small rope line where you have all those contenders on the inside. I, I'm not sure how many teams belong in there right now. And I, I think on the field, it's a fascinating first half of the season that has left some doors open for teams to have strong finishes and get into the playoffs if we stay on schedule. Yeah, I do not think there is one team. I don't even think the Steelers. I mean, yeah. and look, the Steelers have beaten two of the best 10 teams in football Agreed. on the road the last two weeks. So uh, however difficult it was, I don't really care. They won the games. They survived the test. But, Mike, let's just do this. Yes. I'm going to go in pods of five. Got it. And I'm going to tell you, here's my one to five. And, again, had I done this, after last night instead of before last night, I would not have had Tampa as high as, as I did. Okay. And it isn't that I don't trust the Bucks to be a contender the rest of the way. Look, Bruce Arians told me last week, flat out, one, the first thing I said to him, why Antonio Brown, the first word out of his mouth was injuries. Mm -hmm. And you saw it last night. They love this little kid, Scotty Miller from Bowling Green. Yep. Uh, runs a 4 3 4 40. He is a fantastic He's not, a, he's not a slot receiver. He is an outside receiver, and he is a dangerous player. Agreed. But he's playing with hip and groin injuries right now. He, he, he uh, limped off the field in the Meadowlands twice mm -hmm. on Monday night. And so you have that. you got the Chris Godwin injury. And I'm not defending the signing of Antonio Brown, but I'm saying there is a reason. It's not just to say, hey, Antonio Brown's there. Let's go get him. It's right. because... Listen, I know this is crazy. Sunday night in New Orleans, I think Antonio Brown is going to have a big role in this game because they're just not healthy enough and they can't afford to lose that game to the Saints. But anyway, go let, me go, go. let me go one to five and you argue with me, okay? Okay. One Pittsburgh, two Tampa, three Kansas City, four Seattle, five Baltimore. I know you're going to probably move Kansas City a little bit based on what you saw with Tampa. I, I think overall those are about right. And Baltimore and Pittsburgh can play anywhere, anytime, and it's going to be a three- or four-point game and yeah. a razor-thin margin, right? How many times have we seen it? I, I think just because we saw Pittsburgh go to Baltimore doesn't mean it might not be the reverse on Thanksgiving night. So I, I like those five. Kansas City might be the team of the bunch that I have the most confidence in. If I put yeah. my head on my pillow tonight and say, okay, who am I sure is going to be there? Kansas City would probably give me the most comfort to get a good night's sleep. Hey, Kansas City-Pittsburgh would be an incredible mm. <laughs> AFC championship yes. game. No matter where it's played, it'll be great. All right, let's go six through 10. Okay. Six Tennessee, seven Green Bay, eight New Orleans, nine Buffalo, 10 Miami. I would move New Orleans higher. Just in my opinion, I, 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 they, I think they've come through a really key stretch, yeah. missing both receivers and come up with a couple of big wins here and a gutsy win against Chicago. For whatever reason, we always focus on Drew and their offense and the precision and Kamara and all of that. Defensively, they've answered more questions than not over the last couple of years. And I'm sure Dennis Allen's going to get a look at head coaching jobs, which open somewhere here in the league uh, over the next couple of years. But, Peter, just those, those six through ten, tell you right there what I was talking about, how it's very hard to find that group of elite teams because yeah. Buffalo has looked at it for a minute. They haven't looked elite the last three weeks. Uh, yeah. Same with Green Bay. So 
I, I'm with you. When you I look never at that. would have put. I never in a million years would have imagined I would put Miami right number ten. Right. But right now, I watched almost every snap of their game on Sunday against the Rams, and I said, "Look, I like the Rams." But I watched that game, and I said, "That defense yes. in Miami is really, really good." And you know, I believe this, and and I don't know Brian Flores. You know, I've talked to him a few mm-hmm. times, but I do not know him. But I have a feeling that if Tua plays that way two or three more weeks, he'll go back to Ryan Fitzpatrick. I don't think he'd be afraid to. I, 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 yeah. think, I think Tua is on a team in a situation now where you can, quote, I hate the word manage, but you can yeah. handle the game, not make too many mistakes. Let, let, let's see how he does against a good and on-the-come Arizona team. That, that'll be fascinating. I mean, who, who would have thought that Kyler and Tua would be a game that you can't wait to watch? And that's yeah. – uh, that's one of my can't wait to watch games of week nine. I love Kyler Murray. Yeah, I just love I just love watching him play. Um, all right, here we go. Eleven to fifteen. Yeah. Eleven Arizona. Twelve Rams. Thirteen Indianapolis. Fourteen San Francisco. Fifteen Chicago. Yeah, the San Francisco injuries concern me a bunch. A lot. Just yeah. too just too much at this point. And now with Garoppolo and Kittle, it just really takes it down a little bit. Um, you know, Indianapolis, Peter, they, they, they caught my eye in the game against Detroit because they controlled that game. I know Detroit got a little bit closer. Uh, Riv- Rivers has been steadier and getting yeah. more comfortable. And I've got to tell you, if, if there's a coach who I would say, hey, go, go coach my 20 here, whatever it is, Frank Reich would be near the top of that list. Yeah. He just, he, just um, he exudes a confidence and a belief. So if there's a team that I would go to the old billboard countdown and say with a bullet, <laughs> Indianapolis would be that team. I think they got a chance to move up into that top 10 in the next week or two. And heck, we'll see them against Tennessee this week. Yeah. I, I, there's a lot of teams in there that are so interesting. Like, for instance, I mean, I do not like the Bears at all. No. I mean, I like the Bears on defense, but I thought Troy Aikman was amazingly <laughs> frank yes. in that game on, this, on Sunday. Because, I mean, you could just tell he's looking at that and say, because, and one of the things I wrote in my column on Monday is, man, Matt Nagy, you know, it, it, it cut his teeth under Andy Reid, really a smart. I've got a lot of admiration for his offensive knowledge. And sometimes he's got to look out at that team and say, how did I get here? What happened? How is my offense looking like this so far into my sort of right. teaching reign with this team. And what it's does really it remind weird. you? What does it remind you? It's players. You can have plays. Yeah. You can have you can have a you can have a spreadsheet. When I used to walk, work with Jaws doing Monday Night Football, he always used to talk about an IHOP menu. You can have one of those big IHOP menus, yeah, all the yeah. pretty colors and boxes That's and everything. Good. <laughs> it's great. But if you don't have players, they don't mean a darn thing. And right now he doesn't have the guys that, you know, those Kansas City plays look a lot different when it's Kelsey and Tyreek and the whole neighborhood and Mahomes getting them the ball. Yeah. Uh, let's go 16 to 20. 16, Las Vegas. I'm fascinated with Vegas. I think they're really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I could have put them around 13 or 14. But anyway, 16, Vegas. 17, Cleveland. I just don't trust the Browns. 18, Carolina. 19, Cincinnati. I love Joe Burrow. <laughs> we all do. We all I mean, do. 20, we all do. Chargers. I, and look, I, I got more email uh, Monday with saying, oh, my God, you got the Chargers ought to be 31. They shouldn't be 20. But there's something about the Chargers. And I know they can't hang on to leads. But I'd, I'd, I'd go into any game that I would play the, the Los Angeles Chargers thinking that I got a really good chance to lose this game. That's an right. explosive team. But anyway, and, that's 16 through 20. And, and look at the quarterbacks, Herbert and Burrow, who have given that the, both yeah. of those teams some life. Yeah, Peter, you, you, you remember the drill from when you did the show. We're doing football night in America, and the games are on as we're on. So we're on live, and you're keeping an eye on games. You're looking over, looking over. There was no way on planet Earth Denver could have come back the way I watched that third quarter before we went on the air. And now I'm watching. They're driving. They're scoring. They're driving. They go, where did this team come from? And yeah. the Chargers, this happens to the Chargers every other Sunday at about 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific. It's, <laughs> it's maddening. I mean, they get five games that they, they could have won any one of those games yeah. for the most part that they've lost this year. Quickly on the Raiders, you mentioned them. You know, I watched them obviously closely because of my friendship with John Gruden. And uh, 
they've got something about them. Uh, yeah. they, they play, they, they seem to be thriving in ad- adverse situations. And the weather was miserable. It was awful. They were, the players were somewhat traumatized with what happened with Trent Brown in the locker room yeah. before the game. Well, they, they went out and won one of those like kind of street fight kind of games against Cleveland where it was so difficult to make any plays. And they're building something of a, of a toughness and a character. And even though, you know, we think of John with spider two wide banana and quarterback play and all that stuff. And he, he loves a physical team and the Raiders are developing that physicality. That was a big win for them. If they can bankroll that, get back to back, they have the chiefs coming to their place in a couple of Sunday nights and they've already beaten them once. That could be one of the more fascinating games in November. That's not yeah. on your radar right now. Yeah, that's really, really good. All right, let's, yep. let's go quick. We'll go 21 Philadelphia, 22 New England, 23 Detroit, 24 Washington, 25 Minnesota. Philadelphia's yeah. got a chance. They got a chance. Their defense yeah. getting better. If the offense gets healthy, you know, can you see them reasonably being a 500 team and controlling that division? Yes. I can't see them getting to 500 with, you know, I, what's incredible. We talk about Daniel Jones and turnovers. Carson Wentz, eight games, 16 turnovers. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. It's almost like. I, I was thinking the other day watching him. He he almost reminds me of Steve Sachs or Chuck Knobloch or <laughs> what we saw this year with Jose Altuve. You almost they're all it, you almost think it might be in his head a little bit right now. It's making plays you think at this point he wouldn't make. You know, the yeah. clean, get rid of the ball, take a sack. You're not you know that whole live to see another down. You know, the the only play is throw it away. Those things you think are cemented in the head of a quarterback at this point. You love the fact he's trying to make a play, but too many big mistakes. Even Sunday night, the the fumble turnover on a play that he had nothing going on. You just hope that they can get to a point where they're a little steadier on offense because the defense can play with people. We'll end this. uh, There's nothing fun at the end. (laughs) 26 Atlanta, 27 Denver, 28 Houston, 29 Dallas who I picked to be my number one seed in the NFC. Uh, 30 New York Giants, 31 Jacksonville, and 32 the Jets. And I'll just make a quick point off of that, Peter. Think about this for a second, okay? You have the two New York teams, and obviously the big market that they carry, both teams from Texas, Houston and Dallas. The Patriots, who've been the flagship team for the league for the last 15 years, those, those are five teams that carry a lot of eyeballs. And those teams are really struggling. And those cities have no energy or passion for football right now because their teams don't have a prayer of getting in it. And it's just a really, it it says a little bit about the power of the NFL that people are still watching the games as much as they are when you're taking away those, that many viewers on a regular basis. And you just, you just miss them. You miss the Cowboys, you miss the Patriots, you miss the Giants and Washington being really good football team. Here's what I say about the Patriots, though. This is the best franchise in sports in the 21st century. Yep. The 21st century is 20 years old, mm-hmm. and there's no question that the best franchise in any sport uh, in America has been New England. And, and again, look, I'm not rubbing my hands in glee and saying, oh, good, time for a correction for the Patriots. But, you know, it's I, I don't want to say they deserve it. That makes it sound sort of vindictive. But... This is what the NFL does. Yes. And at some point, it's very logical. I don't care if the head coach is Bill Belichick and your offensive coordinator is Bill Walsh. I, it, these things happen, and they will happen. And I'll say this. Tom Brady was the absolute best deodorant for a bad offense for the mm-hmm. last two or three years. And uh, I think he's – I think everybody knows now why Brady left, it, just right. because it was just – it was it was enough. You know, he wanted to go somewhere. You know what he said to me, Mike, in the summer when when I went down to Tampa? One of the things he said to me, it was great. He said, you know, Peter, I this is my 30th year playing high school, college pro football. Yeah. This is the first time I've had an offensive head coach. And you go back four years in high school. It was a linebacker, an old linebacker. Uh, then Lloyd Carr at Michigan for five yep. years. And then obviously Bill Belichick. And you just think to yourself, that is positively, absolutely amazing. Peter, I was, in his 30th year, he, he has an offensive guy. I was going for my morning walk uh, in northern Michigan as we were wrapping up the end of our summer vacation and listening to that podcast. And I remember exactly the spot I was when I heard, when I heard that. 
and I get, I, I, I just shook my head. I said, wow. I, I, you, yeah, that's amazing. It's hard to believe that none of us, <laughs> all of us who cover the Patriots and have done Tom Brady's story from a hundred different angles, never really put that together, right? Well, and, that's uh, because that's because how would we know what the area of specialization of I forget the guy's name, the high school, uh, the high school his coach, high school right. coach? Yeah, we would have no idea. We know Lloyd Carr, exactly. We know Bill Belichick, but right. I mean, we, we had we had two thirds of the answer. We we could yeah, have asked about yeah. the first one real easily, but just to hear that was fascinating, and it, it's it, it does it does make a difference because the building's tone is set on that, and to me, Peter, that's been so much of the the magic of Bill Belichick over the years is that he knew how to ride that offense when he needed to ride that offense. And Parcells was like that too. Remember the Monday night yeah. game where Parcells had Bledsoe throw, or Vinny, I forget who it was, throw like 50-something passes and set records and things like that. They, they just know who they have and how to mold their team. And that's where this New England thing is so striking. Uh, they just don't have the people to mold this year. Yeah. And how quickly will it rebuild will be fascinating to watch. Mike, we'll get you out of here on this. Yes. You, um, you do, um, you're going to do Notre Dame Clemson, mm -hmm. which I think is really one of the, going to be one of the most interesting sports events, uh, clearly of this weekend and maybe of the entire month. Right. But I just wonder now, now that you know a lot more than I know about this, what's your gut feeling now about Trevor Lawrence? what he does after this season. Does he definitely go pro? And do you think he would chafe at the prospect of going to the New York Jets? I think he's a pretty special kid. I think he loves Clemson and he loves college football. He stepped up and was one of the early leaders of let's play. Yeah. And uh, he went in his evolution at Clemson from, you know, freshman, quiet, shy, pleasant, no, nothing negative in any way about that. But he has – continue to grow and emerge as the spotlight has gotten brighter. And I think given that if he is healthy after dealing with COVID here for last week and this week, not playing against Notre Dame, didn't play against BC, if he's healthy and plays and wins a championship, I think it'll feel like it's time to move on for him, even if it is the Jets sitting there at number one. He, he's got something about him. I think that uh, he has loved college. He's had college at the highest level here for two or three years. Uh, they've got a pretty good quarterback who's going to play Saturday for Notre Dame against Notre Dame right behind him who played well against BC. DJ um, DJ is his name, and he's got a, a long last name that Uyangalale that people will start yeah. to get to know if he's good. Uh, so I think I think it'll be time for him to go and to move on. I really do, but I'm excited to watch him finish out the season and watch this Clemson team make a run because they have a lot of young players around him. And Travis Etienne, the running back, is pretty special. It's just disappointing for him, I'm sure, as an individual and for all of us as fans to watch a kid like that uh, who's one of those generational-type players in terms of a franchise quarterback in a school have the chance to play at Notre Dame in a number yeah. one against number four primetime game and not be able to see it. Uh, I'm sure it's a bummer for him. It's a bummer for us. But there are a lot of really good guys in orange who are going to be playing that. I, I, watching Clemson close here the last three weeks, Dabble Sweeney's built an incredible – incredible program down there and it's uh it's really a pleasure to watch them play yeah i'll definitely as i'm sitting here doing a lot of my early stuff that game will be on i'll watch every snap of that game i'm really looking forward to it mike i really appreciate you taking all the time we went longer just because you were you were too good i just couldn't <laughs> shut you up well Thank as, you. You, as usual you know, peter i never get a chance to talk about sports on tv or radio <laughs> so uh, or podcast so it, the opportunity, I, I came out of my shell a little bit. So and I'll tell you this. The people who live in my town of Ann Arbor are very happy that we didn't get to talk about Jim Harbaugh being on the hot seat <laughs> yeah. because they would like to say, let's talk about that next year. So stay well, buddy. Thanks a lot, Mike. You take care. See you here, Peter. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.